So the Delhi Declaration is undoubtedly a diplomatic triumph for India. It's a, it's, it's a good achievement because right until the G20 summit was being convened, the widespread expectation was there would be no agreement and that therefore a uh, joint communique might not be possible. We might have to end up with a chairman summary. The reason for that in particular, the main reason was the big gulf between those who wanted a, uh, a condemnation of the Russian war in Ukraine and those like Russia and China who wanted no mention whatsoever of that subject. India was able to find a formula to bridge that gap, and that is a significant diplomatic achievement, because when there is a summit without uh, uh, a joint communicate, it is always seen as a setback for the chairman. Here, the chairman has pulled off a diplomatic triumph. That is the positive thing. But the overall presidency has, uh, has been uh, different from previous presidencies, and there are both good and bad elements in it. With the G20 summit itself, we saw two very disappointing developments. One was the complete exclusion uh, of the public interest from the summit. You found, for example, the shutdown of Delhi for three days uh, with great difficulties caused to daily wage workers and others who had no income for those days. Uh, the attempt to hide poverty uh, rather than to deal with the poor and the system during this difficult time. Uh, this was really disappointing. The second negative in terms of the summit itself was the complete failure to accommodate uh, the opposition. The same spirit of accommodation and conciliation that we saw in achieving the declaration was not extended in the domestic concept, in the domestic context to Indians. <laughs> the leader of the opposition was not invited. <laughs> the um, opposition members of parliament uh, were not invited, not even the members of the relevant parliamentary committees dealing with foreign affairs. Nobody was invited to any of the events, the receptions, or the dinner. And the result is that a democracy, a country that called itself the mother of democracy, was showcasing an event from which the democratic opposition was excluded. I thought that was very unfortunate. So that's on the summit itself. On the presidency as a whole, one of the things that was remarkable, I would say, about the government's conduct of the presidency was that they did something that no previous uh, G20 presidency has done. They actually uh, made it a huge nationwide event, 200 meetings in 58 cities, a huge amount of uh, action, and, and, and the conversion of the G20 into a sort of people's G20 with public events, um, uh, the, the Holmdom Festival, the University Connect program, the uh, civil society and think tank meetings, all of these things were unprecedented. No other country has done anything like that. And that is, in some ways, uh, both a credit to India for uh, taking the message of the D20 to the entire people, but it's also uh, uh, an attempt by the ruling party to instrumentalize the G20 as something that would turn out to be an asset for them politically. Now, they have every right to do that. They're the ruling party. But no other country has done this before. India has hosted many summits. Never has the ruling party celebrated its leadership in such a way. The whole Vishwa Guru concept, the posters of Mr. Modi every 50 meters in Delhi over the weekend, all of these are advertising the G20 as if it is a personal achievement of Mr. Modi and the BJP government. And that, I think, uh, has raised some eyebrows, even internationally, judging by some of the foreign coverage I've seen of the G20. So success when it comes to the outcome, uh, less impressive when it comes to the democratic practices that were not followed, and um, uh, somewhat sort of curious that the one of the main purposes of the G20 appears to have been to anoint the ruling party and the prime minister uh, for the forthcoming general elections. That would be my overall assessment.